Welcome, everybody. Thank you so much for being here for our winter webinar series. We have a really exciting presentation today with Sarah Nizzi from the Xerces Society. Um, and my name is Kenna Bell. I'm the Education and Outreach Coordinator for the Iowa Organic Association. Um, and I want to save the majority of the hour today for Sarah, but I just want to share a few housekeeping things and um, a short little intro before we get into the presentation. So um, first of all, the Q&A is open. You'll see it at the bottom of your screen. Um, so feel free to type any questions or comments or ideas as you have them throughout the presentation. And I will be um, reading those out loud to Sarah during the last few minutes today so that she can answer them for you and we can start a conversation going. Um, I just want to emphasize that there are no stupid questions. I know I'm just getting back into gardening myself and there's so many things I don't know. So um, if you have a question in your mind, I guarantee you someone else could benefit from um, hearing the answer to it as well. Um, and I'm also recording the webinar today. I'll be posting it to our IOA YouTube page later this afternoon. Um, so it'll be available there and definitely for continued viewing and sharing. Um, and I'm going to send that link out to each of you this evening, along with a link to a very short survey. So if you have time to fill that out, it just takes like five minutes and it's super helpful for us as we continue planning our education and outreach programming. Um, we really want to make things as relevant and interesting and helpful um, for as wide a group as we can. So um, yeah, I think that's the housekeeping. And then I'm going to just share my screen and do a super brief overview of the IOA. Let's get that. Awesome. Can you see that okay, Sarah? Awesome. Okay, cool. So um, for those of you who are maybe new here, the Iowa Organic Association um, was founded in 2006. We are a statewide nonprofit. Um, we have a statewide presence, um, diverse community of farmers, gardeners, food farm businesses, researchers, and consumers who champion organic um, production and products. And our mission is to advance organic agriculture and food systems across the state. And we value ecosystem integrity, community and collaboration, and economic vitality. And we have a variety of uh, priorities and programs. So um, one of our focuses is education and training. So of course, this winter webinar series is a part of that. But we also do college visits, field days, technical workshops, and we have many additional resources that we provide both online and in print. Um, and all of our webinars are funded through the USDA's Risk Management Agency or RMA grant, as well as much of our other education and outreach programming. Um, we're also available to provide technical support and resources all across the state. So a big part of this work right now is through our partnership with TOP, which I'll talk more about on the next slide. Um, we also conduct outreach, so we travel all across Iowa. This also includes our social media, our website, e-news, and other online presence. So we have a wide variety of ways that we connect with Iowa's organic community and are always looking for more. Um, we also communicate with our policy leaders about organic and about the benefits of supporting and providing policies and other resources for the organic community. And then, of course, we're committed to growing the organic community in Iowa to uh, continue providing support for each other and just grow uh, the overall movement in the state today. Um, so lastly, as I mentioned, a big part of our technical support and outreach programming has been made possible through our partnership with TOP. So we're really grateful and excited about that. Um, we can provide even more resources now to the organic community. Um, and our, our new organic farm advisor, Susanna, is working most closely with TOP. She is doing so many things, but um, one part of that is she's leading our organic mentorship program. Um, and she'll also be involved with um, some of the field days and technical workshops and other outreach events. So if any of you are interested in um, being a part of the organic uh, mentorship program is either a mentor or a mentee. That is still open, so definitely 
um, reach out to Susanna and I've got both of our information here. Again, I'm education and outreach and then uh, Susanna is our organic prime advisor. And then of course our website where you can find all of that information and more. Um, so yeah, that's just a brief overview of what we do here at the IOA, but um, I want to save the majority of this time for Sarah. She's going to be sharing a lot of really great information about um, how we can all support native pollinator habitats and other conservation efforts um, in a wide variety of formats. So without further ado, I will um, make you the co-host if I haven't already. And again, please share any questions or comments you have, and I will read those out at the end. All right, thank you. Okay, how is that looking? Is that looking normal? Okay, excellent. Great. Well, thank you, Kenna. Thank you, Iowa Organic Association for letting me give this talk today. Um, organic site prep is just an increasingly um, more popular, more uh, I don't know, gaining some more traction within the state and people seem to be pretty curious about it. Um, so I am Sarah Nizzi. For those of you that may not know me, I work uh, for the Xerces Society as a pollinator conservation specialist. I cover the entire state. And a lot of what I do is providing um, on the ground technical and or potentially financial assistance to really anyone that's interested in pollinator habitat or diverse native habitat. Um, but a primary focus is definitely within the agricultural landscape and to farmers. Um, I'm also a partner biologist working with the Natural Resource Conservation Service, also known as NRCS. And in that role and with that, like in that capacity, uh, my primary role is training um, NRCS staff and partner staff across the entire state on all things related to diverse native habitat, pollinators, seed mixes, uh, management, all sorts of things. Um, help create a lot of publications and also as of late helping to shape more of the policies. So for their kind of practice standards, their conservation specifications, um, I have a little bit more say in that um, realm that I had previously. So just trying to get all the good pollinator info out there. This always happens with my Mac. So let's do this. Okay. And anyone who may not be familiar with the Circe Society, we're an international nonprofit organization that works to preserve wildlife through the conservation of invertebrates. Um, invertebrates really make the world go round. So if we are conserving for them, we are also supporting many other uh, larger fauna as well as ecosystems. Uh, we're based in Portland, Oregon. We've been around just over 50 years. We started off as solely a butterfly conservation group with just like a handful of volunteers. And we've now worked up to supporting all sorts of invertebrates and have roughly like 70 staff and growing by like the week, it feels like I'm starting to lose track. And we have staff all over the country um, working in a number of different ways. So our primary focus is doing conservation really on the ground, kind of in your face, um, helping people do peer-to-peer -peer learning, um, doing a ton of education and outreach. Um, but within the pollinator team where I am situated, our main goal is to diversify the agricultural landscape. And that's within the public and the private sector. Um, we also have an endangered species team that does um, a ton of policy and advocacy for the, um, the little organisms that we often don't think about. They do their own research, uh, their own various community science efforts with um, the Western monarch population, with bumblebees, with fireflies, um, and then the pesticide team that keeps us up to date on all of the um, pesticide literature that's coming out on various research projects that they're doing on their own with partners um, and yeah and providing their own publications and doing policy and advocacy so i would really say that that on the ground conservation policy and advocacy and education outreach are really like our our main um, bread and butter I'm not sure how many of you may or may not be Xerces members, but I just want to take time in case there are any of you out there to say thank you. 
Um, we greatly appreciate it. We would not be able to do this work without you. Individual memberships, just this last um, annual report made up about 42% of our revenue. So I always keep a really close eye on that because I am just over the years, just immensely um, impressed with the amount of support that we get and we truly, truly appreciate it. So thank you. All right, so today getting into um, the nitty gritty, I'm gonna talk about the importance of diverse habitat and considerations. Considerations is going to come up multiple times. I'm just really gonna hammer it down over and over again. So be prepared for that. Um, of course, organic site prep methods and the details and case studies that go along with that as well as various resources. So I've already mentioned that um, invertebrates and little things really are what make the world go round. And although insects especially can be scary or intimidating or looked down upon for some nuisance, um, really a small, small portion of them are what we would consider pest, roughly 2%. And the rest are most certainly really important to us and very important for ecosystem survival. And habitat plays a really critical role. Um, it's no surprise that uh, pests have um, minimum standards, let's put it that way. Like the bar is very low for them. They thrive in monocultures. They thrive under bare, you know, minimal conditions. It does not take a lot to um, make them happy. They are what we consider generalists. They can occupy a wide array of places um, without you know, a lot going on there. But our beneficial insects and our pollinators do need more. They need diversity. We need to have um, a variety of grasses, such as wildflowers, trees and shrubs in order to support them. So um, a higher bar, let's put it that way. And research has shown that habitat is key and that if more than 20% of a farm is has some sort of diverse habitat on site, um, work or benefits of beneficial insects have been observed. And so thinking about that high bar, pollinators and beneficial insects um, really need to be able to fulfill their entire life cycle. And there are a number of different compo components of that in which we need to um, take into consideration. So nesting cover, overwintering sites, food in the form of pollen, nectar, host plants, as well as alternative food sources. Um, beneficial insects, most of the time, you know, depending on what kind of beneficial insect, their diet can change from when they're an egg um, versus to when they're an adult or a larvae, I should say, larvae to adult. Um, and sometimes it completely changes, like a flower fly, for example, um, will be predaceous as a larvae, but once they're an adult, they're going to forage on pollen and or nectar. But then in the case of beetles, they can be predaceous as well as feed on um, pollen. So keeping all of that in mind, diversity is really, really critical. Floral resources um, are especially important too for um, the life stages of these insects. Um, protein comes from pollen and is essential for egg development and is also increases re reproduction and longevity. So they're alternative food sources, but providing diversity and having floral resources just ensures that you're able to support not only their entire life cycle, but that you're able to keep them around. Um, because we want, especially if we're thinking about organic systems, we need these good insects um, to keep our pests and other things we don't want um, at bay. So not only completing their life cycle, but again, just, um, you know, bringing them in, making sure they stay there for the long term. So when thinking about planning diverse habitat, it's important to choose native plants to your region, matching species to the soil type. Um, by and large, our native species, whether they're a grass or um, a wildflower, have a pretty wide range of um, soil types, but there are some species that are very specific to wet soils or very specific to dry soils. So that's important to think about. There are a few plant species that are considered superfoods for things like the rusty patch bumblebee, like wild bergamot, joe pieweed, um, New England aster, ones that just produce a lot of nectar. 
And then having bloom spring to fall, I think a lot of us are pretty familiar um, with that, but that is just ensuring that there's something to eat for everyone at any given time, because there is a variety of insects out on the landscape from now all the way until, you know, the first week or two into November, depending on the year. So some like bumblebees are out for six months um, being active, doing their thing, and other um, types of insects like flies or our native bees or even moths and butterflies, they can have a much shorter uh, window in different emergent times throughout the seasons. Aggressive species and woody species can be really beneficial for really difficult um, areas like wet areas or a patch of reed canary grass. It might not be the most diverse, um, but certainly it's going to be a slightly better quality habitat. And um, it's just keeping in mind that there are some native species we can use to our advantage in those cases. Um, grasses and sedges are important for structure. They're important for management as well as host plants. Um, so not forgetting that either. Okay, I promise I'm getting to the organic site prep stuff, I promise. Uh, plant materials, I added this stuff in late today, um, but I thought it was important to mention because talking about organic, um, before we even get to like strategy or which method we wanna choose, I think it's important to know what kind of plant materials we want to be using. So plugs are really beneficial for those smaller areas and typically at Xerces, um, especially within the Midwest, we're looking at a 10th of an acre or less. Um, they have a competitive edge, meaning that they're usually, you know, several months old or potentially a year old plant. They have established root structure to some degree. Um, so they have a head start compared to starting with seed on bare ground. It blooms a lot faster, um, but it can be more labor and it certainly can be um, more expensive. Generally, I'm not sure exactly what the going rate is, but it's typically like $3 per plug, give or take. Seed is typically for projects that are larger in size. It just makes more sense because, you know, you don't want to be spending time on your hands and knees planting or maybe water access is an issue. Um, they are slower to establish, whether it's a tenth of an acre or five acres. Um, you're going to do the same type of establishment mowings and doing all the same things to ensure that's a success successful seeding regardless of the size. And I say it's less labor-ish because it does take time, it does take equipment, so um, you're not out of the weeds uh, completely, but it can be significantly less than dealing with plugs and seed is much less expensive. So in thinking about, you know, getting started, what are the goals what are you trying to achieve? What equipment do you currently have access to? That's really important, um, regardless of what, you know, that's important for your site prep, that's important for planting, that's important for management down the road. Um, do you need a contractor? Uh, and do you live on site or close by to be able to monitor these plantings? It's also important to just understand the, the site specific conditions um, in whatever space. Uh, you have the luxury of working in, and that includes soils, sun exposure, um, placement, like how is this habitat going to function with whatever else is going on? Is it hilly? What is the current vegetation? Is it in production already? Has it had production at some point, but it's been foul? Um, is it just, you know, yard grass? Those are all really important things to think about, and all of these um, conditions will kind of determine what plants you use, what type, um, and like what methods make most sense. There are a lot of different habitat options out there that um, anyone can choose from, from you know big scale to small scale, um, field borders, beetle banks, insectary strips, flower and cover crops. You know those are kind of a like short term, but can be really, really beneficial. There's lots of flower and cover crops that um, beneficial insects and pollinators adore. Understory and plantings, drift protection. I'm not going to go through all of these, but it's just like a heads up that um, you can use native plants in a lot of different ways. At Xerces, we have a really wonderful, comprehensive guide on organic site preparation. 
We are hopefully going to be making updates to this publication in the near future, um, simply because we've learned things over time. Um, but I'm going to focus on solarization, smother cropping, and repeat cultivation, because that's what we've used most commonly in the last 10 years um, in the upper Midwest. But this publication gives you a rundown of all these options, case studies, timelines, um, lots of really good information. More considerations. So <laughs> I warned you. Again, what is the current vegetation and how big is the site? Um, unfortunately, we haven't found a silver bullet to really scale up organic conversions. Um, there are some farms that have done some what I would consider significantly large um, habitat projects on organic farms, so it's by no means impossible, um, but it's, I think, important to just really have an understanding of the land you're working with um, and what you're comfortable with. What equipment is accessible, whether that be mechanical, is there water on site, other materials, um, we'll get into the material aspect of this later. Are you using farm bill programs? Farm bill programs are not particularly friendly to organic site prep, mostly because they're on a contract deadline um, that isn't an ecological deadline or time frame, but more you know fiscal money, paperwork, things like that. I would say the Conservation Reserve Program is probably the most limiting when it comes to organic site prep. Um, but that with EQIP, the Environmental Qualities Incentive Program, you have a year to install that habitat. So it's a little more organic site prep friendly, but um, just keeping in mind that there are some limitations and challenges that exist in that realm. And then again, do you live on site or close by? Um, because monitoring the site prep method is really, really important to be sure that it's effective. Okay, so we're gonna get into the different types of organic site prep and some you know, real life case studies that we've done. So solarization is fairly popular, um, especially for specialty crop growers who already have greenhouse plastic laying around. Um, it basically just creates very undesirable um, growing conditions and kind of depletes some of the weed seed bank. Um, the key here is basically to not allow any airflow with um, underneath the clear plastic. In the upper Midwest, um, clear is what we use, but in other parts of the U.S., um, black tarp or black plastic uh, works better. So, you know, it kind of varies with wherever you are. We like four or six millimeter uh, UV stabilized. We really prefer that used plastic is great because we totally understand and acknowledge that there's a lot of waste issues when it comes to all this plastic. Um, you know, prepping the bed is really important ahead of time, but not tilling after the solarization is absolutely key. We don't want to reinvigorate anything that may be laying dormant, and it's certainly not effective on 100% of everything. So plastic can come in various sizes from 64 feet to six feet, um, just throwing that out there. And there's lots of different implements for trenching. Um, this can be very labor intensive and not something that you probably particularly want to do by hand unless you're doing a very small like by square foot um, scenario, which we have done with some, you know, like community groups in cities that are much, much smaller, um, where basically they laid plastic and put brick around it. You know, as long as you're impeding the airflow, it's possible. But in larger circumstances, if you have access to some sort of trenching equipment um, in order to bury that plastic, that is super, super handy. Um, if you have a bunch of miscellaneous plastic or no friends that have it laying around, you can use that too. Um, some of the beauty with organic site prep is that, um, especially on a smaller scale, you can get really creative with what you have and make it work. Um, so that's certainly possible. Greenhouse repair tape is really vital or clear gorilla tape, um, whatever you may have used that's been really effective in the past to patch holes and make sure that we're not encouraging any um, unwanted growth. It's also important to keep the edges mowed uh, simply to keep back any sort of competition that is going to want to establish and move, move in 
um, you know, further down the road, I really advocate for mowing like edges if possible, or just keeping like a clean edge around habitat for potential fire breaks and just to have a separation with some of those weeds that want to move in. You can also reuse the plastic, um, you know, borrow something from a friend, but even on your own farm, you can kind of piece meal at a time. This is an example from Wisconsin, where in the very left photo on the very left side, they are broadcasting an area that was already solar um, solarized. And then, you know, just flipped the plastic over the photos on the right are just a comparison between the two. But after X amount of years, you know, will we even be able to tell the difference? So how this has worked well and how it hasn't. Um, unsurprisingly, solarization doesn't work awesome for plants that are very prickly um, that can break through the plastic that are probably very competitive like Canada thistle, but it has been fairly effective with a bunch of other weeds and in wet conditions, wet soils, dry soils, medium soils. Um, so there's definitely hope. And if there is a, like if the weed pressure is super duper high, you know, you may just need to keep that plastic on a little bit longer. In the previous slide, um, the square picture showed like a seeding in the fall. You could certainly leave the plastic until winter and then a little bit into spring and then do a spring seeding as well. So lots of case by case scenarios. Silage tarp has also become increasingly popular. Uh, many farms use silage tarp just within their everyday growing practices. Um, so, you know, totally, totally an option, um, fairly similar uh, method and circumstance. Smother cropping, basically using cover crops to outcompete weeds is another um, pop very popular one. Uh, many farmers are already using some sort of cover crop. Buckley is probably the most um, popular and yeah, lots of farms are just very, very familiar with buckwheat and how it grows and it's already in, you know, organic growers, I should say, already in their system in one way or another. Um, so the beauty of buckwheat is that it germinates really quickly and it has very large leaves that create a dense canopy, which are all things you want. You want things to germinate quick and you want them to occupy a lot of space to shade things out. Um, smother cropping, ideally, at least one growing season, if not two growing seasons. Um, the timing is very essential, just making sure that you're timing the planting to have it be most effective. Um, you can do a combination of things and then termination just varies depending on the cover crop chosen. So it's just important to know um, kind of what you're working with and the biology and phenology and all that of the plants. So there's a number of different options. Um, but using some sort of non-native annual is ideal, um, or I should say native or non-native annual is ideal. Um, and we've had, you know, case studies with a number of these. I will say sorghum Sudan um, is good for wet areas, but the biomass can be very, very challenging. Um, so we, you know, we've kind of had cases where we've bailed it off and we've burned it afterwards, but that's just something to keep in mind. Um, if anyone were to go down that route, sometimes we need to plant, you know, maybe buckwheat twice in one growing season or have a cool season crop, warm season crop, followed by another cool season crop, um, because they all have different, um, you know, growth patterns. So these are just some examples of cool season smother crops that you could do um, spring into most of the summer and then um, not most of the summer. I take that back. But anyway, spring into early summer late summer into fall, warm season, some other crops that are summer driven, um, lots of different things to choose from. This is an example of a very weedy, undesirable patch of Queen Anne's lace from, I can't believe it, 10 years ago. And they used a buckwheat smother crop the following summer, very healthy plant growth there. That fall, they did a seeding and it looks like they probably um, maybe lightly tilled, but maybe not. Um, and did a seeding as well as planted plugs. Um, some species are hard to establish by seed. So if there's something that you really, really want, you could think about planting plugs alongside the seed as well. 
um, just being sure that you're watering them and um, taking care of them so that they survive the winter. And then that was a photo from a couple of years later. And I would love to see how this farm is doing right now. I believe this was a Minnesota case study. So repeat cultivation is another option that a lot of folks have used. Um, we emphasize using implements with very shallow depth. We don't want to do deep tillage. We don't want to be turning the soil like completely over. Um, it will need to be repeated several times throughout the growing season. Um, and that timing is just really critical, you know, before things go to seed, while they're actively growing. Um, we have had very variable results, and I'm going to talk about a case study right after that, that um, is going to kind of go through all of those things. And we've determined that this is probably a good method if the weed pressure is like relatively low, if an area has already been in cultivation, or um, maybe if it's just like Kentucky bluegrass or something like that. Um, but flat areas, dry to medium soils, preferably not wet areas. So this is an Iowa case study where they used repeated tillage and they really planned, planted, and managed their habitat pretty much the same way that they would for all of their specialty crops. So they had the same, um, same length of rows, they had the plants planted at the same width at which they would do any of their other vegetable or fruit growing. Um, and they were planting beetle bakes. So after you know, many rounds of tillage, they used a bed shaper to kind of mound up the site um, because this was specific for a beetle bank. So that's kind of why that was used. And then the first year, um, similarly to what they would use with their crops, they have a belly mounted um, finger weeder implement that they were able to pull behind with the natives to manage those weeds. Um, that same kind of late summer fall that they planted and in the following year while they were still relatively small. Um, so that is just an example of um, a case where it all the, like majority of the planning really revolved around what they had available to them. And this particular farm is really fortunate to have um, a lot of really awesome equipment. So that's certainly not the case for everyone. There was um, definitely some lessons learned. Uh, the habitat was planted in the very late August of 2019. Um, the bottom left is an example, like a photo of those finger weeder things that go through and cultivate. But the main takeaway was that tillage started in, I think, May, late May-ish. Um, and the, the farm manager at the time said, I probably should have started tilling sooner in the spring. Um, I maybe should have irrigated some of the areas because there was rain in the spring, but then it was like a drought in the summer. And so that weed growth was not being stimulated. And that's kind of the catch 22 with tillage is that we often think like, oh, well, there's no weeds growing, there's no problem. Um, but actually we do wanna be stimulating that growth so that we're repeatedly hitting back those plants while they're actively growing. So um, I'll talk about that more, but all that to say like many lessons learned, but still a successful project and talking with um, some of the new staff members on the farm, you know, a couple years ago, they were all still very happy and satisfied and seeing very cool things. Organic herbicides, um, pretty straightforward, you know, typical to any other herbicide, but using non-selective, non-persistent herbicides is great. Um, just a case study example, cultivating early in the spring, encouraging that weed growth, doing repeated applications over the growing season, any time that vegetation got to four to six inches, um, not tilling afterwards. And then you could seed um, in the fall or the following spring. So I am not um, I am not super hardcore when it comes to seedings. I think there there are reasons where fall and winter seedings of natives are certainly beneficial, but I think, um, they can like fall dormant spring, they can all be successful. And I think it should be timed on what is ideal for you. <laughs> so, um, so I know we talk a lot about fall seedings, um, but I've planted prairie in the spring and I don't really, really have a preference. So just throwing that out there. Uh, but the big takeaways with organic site prep is basically 
tailor your approach to best target whatever you have on site and definitely prioritizing those perennial weeds. That is what we're going to be concerned about is perennial weed vegetation. Annual weeds, not a big deal. We can handle annual weeds. The natives will eventually outcompete those um, pretty, you know, like low on the totem pole in terms of weeds, acknowledging that it could take multiple methods, you know, tillage plus cover crops, for example, and or multiple seasons, um, just depending on that weed pressure and maybe, you know, the type of seeding that you're doing or planting. Um, choosing aggressive species can be really advantageous depending on the site. Using as many functional plant groups, you know, warm season grasses, cool season grasses, sedges, uh, a multitude of different wildflowers are all going to be very beneficial. And then uh, in some cases, using a higher seed rate um, can also increase your success um, potentially. And I think with organic, it's important to use a higher seeding rate. If we're working in wet soils, I really think it's important, kind of regardless if you're doing it organically or not, um, a higher seeding rate has proven to be more successful in those cases. And then, yes, using plugs if need be. And for seedings, again, regardless of really the size, they're going to be treated the same way. They're going to need establish establishment mowings in year one, potentially year two, depending on the weed pressure. Or if it's small, you know, a weed whacker, um, it's, if it's a small enough area, um, a riding lawnmower. I've also worked with folks on a case-by-case -case scenario for that. And no matter what the plant material is doing, consistent monitoring all the time for the lifetime of the planting. Um, we want to be able to handle and get on top of those problematic perennial weeds before they become a huge issue. And that can be done through spot treatments. And then of course, if we're doing plug plantings that generally requires hand weeding either by hand or with hand tools or a weed whacker, um, whatever makes sense for the site. And then hopefully by you know, two or three, that native planting can kind of sustain itself and you're only weeding, you know, as needed here and there. Providing habitat is super, super beneficial. So, I mean, there's lots of different ways that we can do that. We can plant all these grasses and flowers and things like that, but also having areas of rock, rock piles, brush piles, kind of neglected spaces um, that already exist. Um, you can call those habitat leaving the leaves, um, doing a number of these things will um, will bring them in <laughs> and hopefully keep them there. So um, lots, lots and lots of testimony to, um, to go with that. And just more wrap up and then moving into resources. Um, time is really significant any site prep method, but especially when it comes to organic. Um, and for anyone that's growing organically, you already know that. Um, choose the method that you're comfortable with. If you're growing organically um, in whatever capacity, big or small, there's probably like a tool or something you're already using, whether that's tillage, whether it's cover crops, et cetera. Um, and yeah, just whatever method makes sense for your site. Um, a lot of this stuff is very case specific. And plant diversity, I've talked about it a ton, but it really is super important. And when it comes to organic, I really believe utilizing all the tools available to you um, is really gonna set you up for success. And especially when thinking about small scale, whether um, in your yard or in a small garden, um, when it comes to organic site prep, you can get very creative, um, you know, putting like sheet mulching with leaves and newspapers and cardboard, that is totally sufficient. Anything that smothers it and doesn't allow airflow, great. Um, tarp you have laying around, whatever. <laughs> um, just, it's just a matter of leaving it there for a pretty significant amount of time to ensure that it's doing its own thing. But um, I kind of like the, the creativeness about it and what people have used. I have learned in recent times that drought um, is likely going to make some of this um, difficult. Buckwheat, for example, doesn't like dry, super duper hot conditions. It doesn't grow very well. So that's not awesome. <laughs> that's not great if we're using it as a smother crop. Um, tillage, I've already mentioned that, um, you know, if there's no stimulation for those weeds to grow and for you to knock them back, and that includes 
herbicide application too, if you're doing it organically, um, that can be an issue. So, and it's just all to say that like nobody is an expert on this subject. Um, Xerces has had, you know, 10, 12, maybe 15, maybe 15 years of experience in this realm. Many other organizations um, are not really experimenting with this. A lot of people don't believe in organic site prep for habitat, um, but it's, I think we should still all be experimenting and, you know, just all of you guys giving us grace that we have, we don't have it all figured out. And when it comes to native plantings in general, we know a lot of things about prairie ecosystems and other Iowa ecosystems, but we're not mother nature and we'll never have all the answers. So we're just appreciate everyone that's along for the ride. Um, as part of my NRCS hat, there are farm bill programs to address any resource concerns you may have. Um, I've talked about these a little bit, but the Conservation Reserve Program is admitted, administered by the Farm Service Agency, and NRCS is simply the technical assistance kind of in partnership in that regard. EQIP and CSP are NRCS programs. They are providing the administration, the contracts, the paperwork, as well as the technical assistance. Um, EQIP is great for a lot of different reasons. It has a multitude of different conservation practices available. Um, CSP is really for growers that have um, a system in place. EQIP and CRP, you can be like, I want to do this in this field, and that's fine. With CSP, we're going to be looking at the entire system, your entire farm, and it's really meant for growers that they have a system in place. They've kind of like, I do this every single year. This is working for me um, because you're going to be locked in in a five-year contract. And it's like, you're going to be having to do those same things five years in a row. So you want to be sure that they're not something you're trying new for the first time. Um, and yeah, and those that have already dabbled in conservation practices and, you know, where where are other resource concerns that haven't been addressed yet? So that's that's where CSP comes into play. We also have a habitat opportunity for urban farms across the entire state of Iowa, um, thanks to Iowa NRCS, Xerces Trust, and a partnership with Practical Farmers of Iowa. Um, this is an example of Sweet Tooth Farm in Des Moines, where we did about 100-ish square feet of a native planting on an area that was just really sloped, uh, horrible to mow, horrible to maintain. Um, and then on the flat just behind Monica there, she has um, a production site. So it must be EQIP eligible since this is NRCS um, funded. And um, yeah, and so urban, EQIP eligible, and also a within like the underserved um, community. Um, so fitting within the NRCS criteria. So if anyone is interested in that, you can go to the PFI's website. I should have linked it here. I'm very sorry for that. That was that was an oversight. Um, yeah, go to their website, go to cost share, meander your way through to the beneficial insect application, and we will, you know, get in touch with you and um, see how that goes. But we have a lot of active farms already, and funding is available until August of 2025. Um, so this will be going on for a little while longer. At Xerces, we have a ton of resources through our website. We've got a bunch of new resources that have come out in the last few years um, for those of you that may have been following us for a while. And um, the website's daunting. So if anyone is looking for something specific, please feel free to email me. It might be a lot easier for me to find it and or give you other resources too in the meantime. I have no problem with that. It is it's not a big deal. Do not hesitate to reach out. And I also want to take time to just thank any of our partner farmers that we have worked with um, in Iowa, Minnesota, Wisconsin. There have been so many over the years, and we really cannot do this work without you. We would not, I would not even be able to give this presentation if it wasn't for the farmers that decided to take a risk, try something new experiment alongside us in hopes of, you know, finding successes, figuring out what works, what doesn't work. Um, so we we at Xerces just, you know, like organization wide, 
um, just really appreciate all the farmers that we worked with, you know, not only with just this project or my position, but all over um, the country and in other countries um, within North and South America. So thank you, if y'all, if any of you all are on here and watching later, um, and to those that we may not have met yet. And with that, I will go ahead and take questions and yeah, we've, we've got some time, so that's good. Thank you so much, Sarah. That was so much awesome information and we've got a ton of great questions already. So um, yeah, thank you again for the presentation and thank you all for all the questions you've uh, put in so far and feel free to keep adding more. Um, I will start with kind of go in order maybe of, of your presentation for now. So um, someone's asking, when you're talking about um, beneficial insects, could you talk a little bit more about um, alternative food sources and how we can help provide them? Maybe like some specific examples? Sure. Um, so for example, uh, well, I kind of already gave an example, but those, those ground beetles are um, very predaceous. They also, they can, they eat weed seed, um, they eat other things like aphids, but they also rely on pollen for reproduction and that egg development. Um, so that is an example of something that probably prefers to eat prey at the end of the day and or weed seeds, but in a time where that pest window might be dormant, um, they need the, they can rely on those other sources and they need those other sources when other things aren't around. Um, so that's probably the best example I can give to that. But really, I mean, a lot of it too is just the fact that those life stages really vary with their diets. Um, so wasps and flies have completely different diets from larvae to, um, to adults. And so, yeah, having <laughs> that's kind of the alternative food source in a certain degree, but um, yeah, basically having diversity just ensures that um, they're not going to go hungry by any means at any stage, hopefully right. in life. Right. <laughs> so I love the that answers the question a little bit. No, totally, totally. Um, I know you talked about that a little bit already, but that was some more specific. So that's helpful. Yeah. Um, we've got a couple of questions about climate change. So mm -hmm. Um, I'm going to add to this one. So how is it already affecting um, insects and pollinators mm. in Iowa? And how do you see it continuing in the future? Okay, so climate change with question. in general. <laughs> yeah. yeah, that's a really big question. Um, well, drought, like, so in Iowa's case, we're getting hotter and we're getting drier during the summer. And I think, you know, certainly in very recent years, like, I think people with this past winter, people that don't generally talk about climate change are suddenly like, gosh, what's going on? Um, mm -hmm. But drought is not good because it stresses out plants. Um, it kind of screws up the phenology of what's happening. So in the last few years, I've noticed native plants blooming sooner, blooming for shorter amounts of time. Um, because I think they're stressed out and they're like, I have to reproduce. Like I am here to grow, to reproduce, to set seed, to get the next generation. And so that is not great because that really messes with the timing of when insects have co-evolved with these plants. So mm -hmm. that's really our main concern with climate change is perhaps the, um, yeah, the mismatch between when insects think that they're, you know, oh, I should be coming out oh, but there's no food, or there's food, but there's no insects coming out. Um, and then also for insects, it really stresses their populations. And in bumblebees, I can speak more specifically to, but um, it's drought. You'll see the effects of drought kind of a generation or two down the road. And mm -hmm. it's generally creates smaller colony sizes and smaller individuals that are just not as fit and as healthy as they would be otherwise. So sometimes with insects, it's not something you can immediately see, but it's a trend over time. Right, that makes sense. Besides bees, what are some other pollinator species that we should keep our eye out for? Oh gosh, I don't even know. Um, 
Like that's that's such a big question and I'm not another an one, yeah. <laughs> um, but I just have noticed just generally that it seems like just across the board um, in my observations, insect activity is just decreased steadily. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah. And certainly two years ago, I was doing helping out with research where I was going into reconstructed prairies and going into remnant prairies, collecting um, samples. And I did this in a lot of different sites within central Iowa. And the common theme with all of them was that it was really quiet. All those places were really quiet. And this was mostly done like between late June and most of July. Um, so very like active period traditionally. And so it's, yeah, I don't know if you could really pinpoint like one or the other. Some are doing better, more, you know, some are more stable than others. Some are generalist. The ones that are like rare and specialist and have really like strict criteria for their habitat in order to survive, they mm -hmm. will probably be hit the most. Um, but yeah, I would just say like overall in general, I've just been seeing less insects and I'm attributing it to like the climate change, the drought situations that we've been dealing with. Definitely. Sounds like silent spring. It's so oh, sad. Wow. Yeah. Um <laughs> I will go back a little bit from the big question. Sorry to okay. throw no, that okay. in the beginning. Um I'm glad Susanna asked this because I was also wondering um what is a beetle bank? Oh yes. Okay. Um yeah I threw that out there expecting Questions. A beetle bank is habitat that is specifically designed with ground beetles in mind. So I've kind of talked about ground beetles already, but they're they're really awesome creatures just in general. They're very diverse. Um, they would probably take over the world um, if they had the chance, and maybe they will. But um, it is predominantly planted with native bunch grasses, uh, more so than wildflowers. And that is to provide overwintering and nesting shelter. So giving them a place to be long-term and then adding, like historically, they've always just been 100% native bunch grasses and they mm -hmm. like the bunch structure, they like the bunch and they like having some space and some bare soil. Um, they do not like sod forming grasses and habitat. Uh, the flowers we experimented with in the last like five years to, because we know that they can use flowers as alternative food sources. Um, and, you know, we're doing this for beneficial insect purposes. So why not just invite more pollinators and insects to the farm? So we dabble with adding wildflowers. So they tend to be like a 70, 30% ratio or like two thirds, one third ratio with again, predominantly being native bunch grasses. And it's really with ground beetles in mind specifically. Got it. Okay. Thank you. I've seen this and, you know, happening, but I have never knew that term. So thank you. Um, and then a couple more technical things. So you mentioned cardboard for a couple different things, but um, can you use cardboard for solarization or does it have to be that plastic or tarp? For solarization, it's the clear plastic. So it's like right. penetrating sunlight those plants think that they can grow. And then they're like, oh gosh, it's really hot under here. It's not good growing conditions. So yeah, it's not the same. Um, yeah, it's not the same. Cardboard is really just like smothering out vegetation. Right. More so I than, figured yeah, more so than like that, attempting yeah. to stimulate growth. Like you're probably not gonna deplete the weed seed bank in that way. Totally. So it seems like tarps or at least like recycling old plastic is maybe the most sustainable option when it comes to that, right? Yeah, if you're going to use, yeah, if you're going to use plastic, I highly recommend use plastic and new plastic, you know, there's the waste issue, but then it is incredibly expensive. That makes sense. Yeah. <laughs> um, so per acre um, mm -hmm. for someone who's maybe just getting started What's your estimate of the time commitment that it would take to get a pollinator habitat started? Uh, significant. Um, <laughs> so basically, like, let's just say, let's just start with an acre and then, you know, you can just extrapolate that from there. Um, so you're going to do your site prep and that will take 
whatever method you choose, that's going to take a significant amount of time. But it will, you know, you will have some like rest period where it's doing its thing throughout the growing season. Um, but then you're going to come back and you're going to plant. And that, again, is going to take time. So it's like, I mean, you can't really like 100% walk away for several, several months or a year until probably like year two or year three, depending on the plant materials, the strategy you use, the site prep method. Um, so it's it's kind of like farming. I mean, right. um, it's, <laughs> it, yeah, it, it takes time. So it's it's like farming something different. Um, so if you think about like the time commitment it takes to grow um, crops, it's yeah, it's uh, it's not a you know planet walk away or deal. And then of course it needs maintenance over time. But hopefully with adequate adequate site prep establishment, you know weeding and kind of getting it off to a head start. Hopefully it gets to a point where it can sustain itself to a certain degree where you're only having to go in there minimally or um, depending on how big it is and other things, you know, you burn it only periodically, what have you. Um, that makes sense. And two, three years is just a blip. I mean, with all the benefits, it's, you know, sounds so worth it. And for the farmers here anyway, you know, we're used to it. So <laughs> yeah, and it's, yeah. yeah, it takes a lot of patience and it can look ugly for quite some time, especially with the seeding. I planted two acres and for a while I was like, what did I do? Um, <laughs> and I'm supposed to have all the answers and just be able to do it perfectly. Uh, didn't happen just for the record, but, <laughs> but now it's, you know, it's like really impressive and I don't regret it at all. Totally. No, it's so worth it. Sorry. Mm -hmm. um, I just realized it's 1258, but I'm going to ask one more quick question. And if there's anything else you want to share, um, go ahead. And also, please feel free, everyone who's watching, to continue reaching out and ask questions as you think of them, too, to both of us. So um, you mentioned some of the policy and advocacy work that you've been doing. Is there anything that we should have keep our eyes out for in the policy world right now or ways that we can help support um, all of this conservation work, restoration? Oh, that's a really good question. Um, the, so yeah, there are certainly things within the state of Iowa, um, in terms of policy and habitat that are really important, I think, and a lot of us conservationists think. So supporting anything that goes along with public lands, I know that could be a controversial subject, but, um, in terms of recreation and having spaces and access for people to go, um, so anything that has to do with the, what was, I think they're still calling it, but I think they just call it like fund the trust, but what was Iowa's water land and legacy, mm -hmm. um, there are always bills that, well, it's something that was meant to be funded well over 10 years ago, widely supported by Iowans has never gotten funding that would increase conservation and concert and recreation throughout the state in a multitude of different ways. Um, that you know, we're always fighting for that to get funded. Um, there's always bills kind of um, trying to limit um, public access and public lands. Um, so those are really the big ones. There's lots of water quality issues, of course, pesticide issues um, that have also come into play. Um, nationally, there is um, the recovery, uh, wildlife action, it's raw law, um, recovering some, something, anyway, wildlife action, raw law will get you there. It's like R-W-R-A-W-A. -A. Um, and that is like a national bill that has not been passed yet that would fund and give money to states um, all across the country to um, really enact every state's state wildlife action plan, which every state has. Um, and that would be immensely helpful. So that's kind of a big national thing. And then, yeah, there's always monarch work being done on the totally. national scale. And yeah, there's all sorts of stuff. Um, yeah, but off the top of my head, that's- No, that's a lot. That's great. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much. And yeah, unfortunately we're out of time. I could keep talking forever, but- um, Thank you again for that wonderful presentation, for all the resources you shared, and um, for everyone who is in attendance, for all of your great questions. And um, 
once again, I'll be sending out that link, the survey, the video, um, Sarah's contact information, all of it. Um, if there's something that you missed or want one of the links, feel free to reach out to us as well. And yeah, thank you. <laughs> I just remembered it. Recovering oh, yeah. America's Wildlife Act. So that's Recovering it. America's thank Wildlife Act. <laughs> thank you all. Appreciate Look it. Look it up, everyone. <laughs> awesome. All right. Thank you. See you next time. Take care.